shirt, $125, by Polo Ralph Lauren, tie, $125, pants, $295, by Polo Ralph Lauren, tie bar by the tie bar, shoes, on ground, $395, by Alan Edmonds, socks by Uniqlo, suspenders, vintage Arian Gosling is already timeless. He can go away for a while, do some art movie adventuring and some enthusiastic kid having with Eva Mendes, then waltz right back into his gig as Hollywood's leading leading man. He'll probably do it all again in five years, waltz off, waltz back, slay, repeat. But he was at the Oscars last year, he'll be back this year, and next year he's inheriting Blade Runner from Harrison Ford. Right here, right now, this is Ryan Gosling's next peak. GQ's Chris Heath travels to Budapest to witness it up close. Deep beneath the old castle fortifications in Budapest, on a hill just west of the Danube, is a subterranean labyrinth that winds for several miles. At the very end of one twisting tunnel, a long walk from the surface, there is a chamber, and in its center, barely visible through the smoke that fills the room, is a small crouching statue of a grotesque, winged demon perched above a flat, rectangular tombstone. The tomb's purported occupant is identified by a single chiseled word, Dracula. This is where Ryan Gosling has chosen to meet. Notes on the early life of Ryan Gosling. He just didn't like the way it felt, and he wanted it to be over. I just felt this sense of, I have a limited amount of time and, you know, I've got to get started. I also didn't like the arbitrariness of control that people seemed to have over me, I think most kids don't know to question that. They just accept it, I think my mother encouraged that. I had one teacher, because I was dancing, he thought that was funny and he would make jokes about it in class, and my mother said, you know, if ever you feel like he's being disrespectful, you can just leave, and I did one day. I called her and said, hey, I left, also, when I was homeschooled for a year, I saw my curriculum come in the mail, and I saw that it was just this tangible stack of books, I guess I realized that there were other ways to do it. The fact that I could stay home and watch Planet of the Apes in the morning and then go downstairs and draw while I learned about some historical battle, draw these maps and scenarios and connect to it in a way that was personal to me, I just felt like, oh well, then there must be another way to do everything, and so why would Ryan Gosling choose to meet at Dracula's underground tomb? Did he choose somewhere as far and different as possible from the magical star-filled Los Angeles skies of his new movie, the musical La La Land? Or is he looking to suggest something profound about time and mortality and notoriety that is better demonstrated than explained? Or is it just that, when you're Ryan Gosling, arranging a spooky rendezvous deep below the surface of the earth might be a way of at least staving off the questions he knows are coming? In marked contrast to the thrilling and eclectic parade of characters he's portrayed on screen, just to pick a few career highlights, The Believer, Half Nelson, Larson the Real Girl, Blue Valentine, Crazy, Stupid, Love, Drive, and The Big Short, Gosling has generally preferred to play his cards close to his chest off-screen. Fittingly, when he strolls into Dracula's purported final resting place, Gosling offers little clarification about this choice of location, except to note, if we start with a torture chamber, everything's uphill from here, which sort of makes sense and sort of doesn't. For the record, there is little serious pretense that Dracula is really buried in this tomb, though supposedly Vlad the Impaler was imprisoned somewhere in these catacombs in the 15th century, we linger for a few minutes, making small talk, but it's clear pretty quickly that we've already done just about all there is to do here. As we wind our way to the exit, though, he does acknowledge an ingrained affinity for such places. My mom used to hang out in graveyards when I was a kid, so, he says. She used to like to read the headstones. So they weren't sort of scary places, we emerge into a wet, dark Saturday afternoon. On the street, Gosling tells a man in a parked car that we're going to walk, and we head off, looking for somewhere to sit and talk. Maybe a hundred yards later, a different man approaches Ryan and gives him a briefing about which cafes and restaurants nearby are open, and which are full. It's funny, the way these people associated with Gosling keep appearing out of the rain and darkness, I begin to imagine that there might be dozens of them. I tell Gosling that I like the way he seems to have someone on every block. He nods. Someone on every block, he repeats. Notes on the early life of Ryan Gosling. The next day, he packed his Fisher-Price magic kit with the Gosling family steak knives. Suitably armed, he headed to school, ready to put into action the new lessons he had just learned. I think I saw it too young, he says. I wasn't able to separate those realities. I don't blame it on the film. Part of being a kid in the 80s was that these movies, we didn't have the experience necessarily of going to the theater, of this thing outside your life. 
you would watch it while you were falling asleep on the couch, or you could ray watch it, and they were tangible things, these VHS tapes, and they were like friends of mine. And so I connected with them in a very, you know, personal way, even so, you might assume that taking a set of knives to school was just some inappropriate, but ultimately harmless, play acting. But when I asked Gosling about what was going through his mind that morning, his reply makes clear that the boundaries between reality and fiction were still